Good morning. How's everybody? Amen. Let me hang on, y'all, just a second. Turn some air. Thank you, Becky. Yeah. Good morning. All right. How is everybody this morning? It is good to see you all in our worship service. I have quite a few things to to uh, to take care of this morning. Uh, so if you have your bulletin, there's a few announcements that we'll start off with. Uh, one of them is, um, let, me, let me just talk about last Sunday night for just a minute. Um, again, it was absolutely fantastic. The decorations, the food, um, the, the, the fellowship, everything about it was, it, it couldn't have been any better. Clayland, thank you so much for making uh, making that night uh, possible and everything that you have done uh, uh, leading up to that. Now, talking about the rec center, uh, one of the things that you will notice in the bulletin is that uh, next Sunday we're going to have a collective Sunday school down in the rec center. And uh, we're not going to have Sunday school up here. Uh, everything's going to take place uh, as far as Sunday school is concerned at the rec center. Now, we're going to meet a little bit earlier. We're going to meet at 9 o'clock next Sunday. And now uh, we're going to have uh, uh, breakfast is going to be provided. Uh, we're going to—I know that there's going to be some uh, some pastries that are going to be there. I know that there is going to be some uh, Hardy's sausage biscuits that are going to be there. Somebody say amen to that. And uh, a little birdie told me that there might even be some fresh cane syrup there. Now you're going to be there, ain't you? And uh, I was, I'm just going to throw if anybody would would just you know wants to make a, um, a a breakfast casserole or something and that that would be fine too so anyway we're gonna we're gonna have a good time y'all come next sunday morning this is a collective sunday school for all of us we're going to be together have a time of fellowship have sunday school together nine o'clock in the rec center again that's next sunday morning now we're not done with next sunday yet because it's the sunday before christmas amen and uh, so not only are we going to have that down at, in, in the rec center that morning, but it's also we're going to do uh, your ugliest holiday sweater Sunday. Now, if you don't have an ugliest holiday sweater, just come dressed as festive, as, as Christmassy as you want to be. All right? Now, I know that that's going to open the door for a lot of possibilities, but um, let's have fun next Sunday. Amen. There is nothing wrong with being a Christian, being in church, and enjoying ourselves. So that's what we're going to do next Sunday. We're just going to have a great time, and I encourage you to, to come and to be involved in all of that. Also, throughout the month of December, we take up uh, a collection for the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Again, use the offering envelopes in the pew ahead of you. And I write on there, Lottie Moon or Christmas offering or some way that we'll know on what account to put that into. This Wednesday night is going to be regular services. Youth Keepers of the Faith is going to meet in the rec center at 6.30 Wednesday night. Adults will meet in the overflow edition uh, 6.30 on Wednesday night as well. Also, the church planners out of New Mexico, be prayer for them. And uh, uh, the pastor who had, had also passed of, of COVID. And uh, so uh, a lot of things that are going on, um, I, 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 again, um, Thank you, Clayland, for for the ministry that y'all that y'all mean to this area and to this community. Uh, there's several announcements that we have that are not in the bulletin, and one of them comes from the Kiwanemtua family, uh, especially uh, Casey Kiwanemtua. Uh, he would like to send his thank you for all of your prayers, your support, and uh, to him and uh, and to that family. Uh, also, you'll notice this absolute beautiful bouquet of flowers in front of the pulpit. Amen? And um, those flowers have been placed um, in loving memory of uh, Brother Bo Hart and uh, placed by his family, um, as Sandra, Julia, and, uh, and Bobby. Thank you all for, for this. Uh, you know, I, I was talking to someone a little bit earlier this morning and uh, thinking about Christmas and Clayland and the ministry of this church and 
when I think about all those that we have lost in our recent past and uh, boy they're missed they are missed and uh, prayers for the families of those uh, we've lost some good people and uh, but God is still God and God is an awesome God and God has remained faithful to us as we should to him so Clayland let's be in prayer especially during this time of year. Amen? Now, um, one, more, one more thing that we need to do and um, that we need to take care of because um, they were traveling last week. And uh, as, as you know, each year that uh, we like to honor our unpaid musicians. And, and last week, uh, we got to honor most of them. But as one of them was traveling... Uh, she missed out on it. So this morning, we're going to honor Miss Martha Lynn. Thank you. And um, I got to say, you know, uh, there was a long time that the Clavanova, Clavanova stayed quiet. And it sure is good to hear it play again. Amen. So thank you. Thank you to all of our... Uh, unpaid musicians for their week in, week out, uh, the dedication to this church and to this ministry. Anything else before we uh, continue with our service? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, children's Christmas party tonight uh, for Brother Dale's class. Um, age limit on that, Brother Dale? One to 90. So uh, that only leaves about uh, four of you out. So <laughs> anyway, all of us kids, yeah. All right, Brother Dale's having a Christmas party in his class tonight. So anything else? Brother Tim. It's uh, my time to speak. It's going to be short and brief. Uh, uh, this morning's uh, numbers wasn't quite what I expected, but uh, obviously you see that there's uh, a lot of vacancy. Thank you. <laughs> Feed them, they will come. Uh, so uh, next Sunday morning, 9, 40, uh, 9 o'clock, not 9.45, but 9 o'clock, rec center, um, we're going to have a good time. And again, come in your ugliest Christmas sweater or your most festive Christmas attire. We're going to have a good time. Let's stand as we go to our Lord in prayer. I ask that you remain standing as uh, we pledge our flags to the front. Let's pray. Father God, what an absolute awesome God you are. Lord, we thank you so much for the day that you've brought us to for this time of worship. That, Lord, we lift up our voices in prayer. We lift up our voices in praise. And, Father, we lift up our hearts in worship. Lord, let everything that we say and everything that we do bring glory and honor to you. Father, we look to you for leadership, for guidance. Father, we, we adore you. We love you. And we thank you so much for your son, Jesus. And Lord, this morning, it's in his name that we pray. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. It's time to recognize our flags to the front. First, to the American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And to the Christian flag? I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior whose kingdom it stands, one brotherhood uniting all Christians in service and in love. And you may be seated. And our call to worship this morning will start out with a Christmas song, Come thou long expected Jesus.
this morning is uh, page 202 if you're looking in the hymnal or it is on the screen and it's all how hail the power of Jesus name <laughs> hymn this morning is page 424 heavenly sunlight
we were talking about this last Sunday. I don't remember who we were talking to. Just about how blessed Clayland is with the talent that we've got. And a lot of times we think, when we think of talent, we think of, you know, musical talent. Um, but there's a lot of people who have the gifts of the Spirit in this church. We just, there's never been a need that we've had in this church or in this community that has not been abundantly met by this congregation. I, I remember there was um, a need that come up one time and we literally had to just deny people and say, no, it's been taken care of. No, 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 no. Because so many people come forward, I want to help, I want to help. And just we, for especially the size of congregation that we have, we just have an abundance of blessing. I just thought about that a minute ago. <laughs> This morning, um, for special music, we all going to be special because we all going to sing it. Um, <laughs> this um, was a request by Bill um, to sing this song because I know he loves this song. So we're singing it out of the, the little hymnal, and it's 137, Beautiful Star of Bethlehem. God is good all the time. I uh, and yes, I, I, that is uh, one of uh, one of my favorite songs. I, I almost said on one of my favorite Christmas songs, but even though it somewhat is a Christmas song, it doesn't necessarily have to be. 
Uh, that, that's one of those that can be sung year-round, amen? And uh, anyway, I do, I do like that song. I uh, <clears throat> got word just a little bit ago that Miss um, Susan had to take Brother Jack Boardwine back into the hospital yesterday. Um, Gene, was it yesterday you had to take him back over there? Ma'am? Saturday. Um, took him back to the hospital. He had an infection. Uh, they took him in to surgery uh, to, to clear that, and uh, the surgery went well. Uh, he is back in his room, and uh, he, he's, uh, he's catnapping a little bit. But um, continue to please be in prayer for the Boardwine family, um, as well as uh, for the center fits. Um, I got a text from Miss Mary Martha earlier today, and I and, uh, said that Brother TJ had had a bad day. Uh, yesterday, he was doing a little bit better today, and uh, so uh, be in prayer for him as well. Uh, this morning, as, uh, as, as we continue our worship, uh, I, wanted, I wanted to come to you with a, with a message uh, talking about Jesus being the Lamb. And uh, it kind of teased off from what we, we were talking about last week. And, uh, you know, and, and I say this all the time. I know you all may get tired of hearing it. But anyway, you know, it seems like by the time you get to the end of October, uh, you just hit the gas pedal you, you, to the floorboard. I mean, when, 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 when Halloween gets here, I mean, you're not even finished with that before, uh, you know, just a couple of, uh, couple of weeks after that is, is Thanksgiving. A couple of weeks after that is Christmas. A week after that is New Year's. And, uh, man, you, you know, uh, where, where are we right now? We're two weeks out from Christmas, three weeks out from, from it being 2022. And it is just hard to believe that everything is happening as, as fast as it is. But, but, I mean, here we are. <clears throat> now, last week, last week I preached a message uh, looking at the reasons as to why we as to why we call uh, Jesus wonderful, and uh, and again last Sunday night, um, it, you, you couldn't have asked for a better Sunday night than what we had last Sunday night uh, down at the Rec Center. Again, the the decorations were uh, done to perfection. The food, fantastic. The, the fellowship. Uh, all of it together. Um, I, I was sitting there last Sunday night and uh, looking around and and um, I had that thought. I said, "Man, this is this is what church is supposed to be. This is what Clayland is supposed to be." And uh, I had a great, great time. So last week we we preached that a message about uh, uh, looking at as to why Jesus is wonderful. And uh, we've looked at some of the names. That Jesus is known by. And this morning, I, I want to kind of take that same thought and that same idea, but instead of looking at the names, I want to look at one of his aspects. I want to, I want to look at, uh, I want to look at him as from the aspect of being the Lamb, the Lamb of God, which is what he is. And um, I, I want to, I want to kind of look at it and think about it, maybe, maybe from God's point of view, just a little bit. Especially when you look at it from God's point of view, from the Gospel of John, uh, you're going to see that the birth of Jesus, the birth of Jesus was God's plan from the very beginning. Um, Jesus, when you look at it from from the Gospel of John, from that first chapter, we find out that Jesus, that Jesus is the Word. We find out that that Jesus is the Light. We find out that Jesus. Is the life I pointed out last week? I think that sometimes that we, especially during this time of year, that we focus focus more on John chapter one and verse number fourteen. When we, when we focus where where Jesus becomes flesh, where Jesus was born, I think sometimes we focus more on that than what we do on the first four verses of John chapter one. Where we focus on, on Jesus being there in the beginning. Where Jesus was with God. Where Jesus was God. There is absolutely no difference when you look at it from that aspect. So it brings up a question. 
when you look at the Gospel of John, that first chapter in the Bible, when it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And He was there in the beginning, the second verse says. It, it brings up a question, or at least it does to me. It brings up the question, and I have to ask myself sometimes, if Jesus was there in the beginning, then shouldn't we see Him not just in the New Testament, because certainly we can, amen? Certainly we can see Him throughout the New Testament. Certainly we can see Him from the time of His birth to the time of His crucifixion. And then, uh, um, and then the writers write about, about Christ throughout from there, especially the Apostle Paul. So certainly we can see Jesus all throughout the New Testament. But if Jesus was there in the beginning, then ought we ought to be able to see Him in the Old Testament as well. And I think the question is yes. If Jesus was there in the beginning, we ought to see Him throughout Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament. And I think that we can. And with that in mind, I want us to look at Jesus I want us to look at our Lord. I want us to look at our Savior as the promised Lamb of God sent to save us from our sins. This morning, as we begin to look at it, we go all the way back to the beginning. You want to talk about the beginning? Let's go back to the beginning. Amen? Let's go back to Genesis chapter 22, shall we? If you go back to Genesis chapter 22, the Bible talks about a great, a great step of faith. You go back to this passage, and you're going to remember it, it even starts back a little bit earlier. You have to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 12 to find the beginning of this. In Genesis chapter 12, God promised, God made a covenant with Abraham. God said, Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. Abraham, you, there are going to be more descendants from you than, than there are sands on the sea. Amen? Yeah, just pick up. Next time you're on the beach, just pick up a handful of sand and go. I don't even come close. Make a great nation through the, through the birth of this promised child. Now, it took a little while for that to happen. It took a little while, about 25 years. <clears throat> About 25 years or so, God delivered on that promise. Chapter 21, we see that promised child was born, Isaac. And something interesting happens. You know the story, you know how it plays out in Genesis chapter 22. As that chapter opens, God gives Abraham some instructions. Some instructions that's going to be very difficult to carry out it's kind of strange instructions if you want to be honest about it because God says Abraham well here's what I want you to do I want you to take this child this promised child that you've been waiting so long for I want you to take this this promised child and 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 I want to I'm going to take you up onto this mountain and and I'm going to show you a place and when you get there I want you to sacrifice your son Interesting. And, and we see as Abraham uh, 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 takes on this, this task, we'll call it for now. Verse number 3 is where we pick up on that. In verse number 3, it talks about the next morning when Abraham has received these instructions. He takes his son and he takes two servants and he sets out on this journey. Now, the Bible tells us that it takes about three days for him to get from where he was to the base of this mountain. Three days, Abraham is traveling with his son and traveling with his servants. And for three days, he has this on his mind. So to get to the base of the mountain, in three days, he leaves his servants there. He says, y'all wait here. Me and the boy, we're going to go up there and we're going to worship. And then he says something interesting. He said, then we're going to come back. We are going to come back. Now, I want you to wrap your heads around what's about to happen. The Bible says that Abraham and Isaac start up this mountain. Can you imagine? First of all, can you imagine how long that three-day journey was for Abraham with this on his mind? When he gets to the base of the mountain, Abraham's thinking, he said, man... 
is getting close. And he takes his son and they start up this mountain. The Bible doesn't tell us how old Isaac was, but we know that he was old enough to, 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 to be able to carry the wood. It says he was carrying the wood. And we also know that he is old enough to understand the concept of the sacrifice. He understands what's about to happen. Can't imagine how hard it would be on Abraham. By the time you get down to verse 6, they're on the way up there. In fact, verse number 7 it talks about this. <clears throat> and Isaac even asked, he says, Dad, he said, um, I know how this whole sacrifice thing works. He said, I understand what's about to happen. And, and, and he says, we got the altar. He said, we have the wood, but there's a problem. He said, we don't have a sacrifice. And it's interesting because, because of what Abraham says to him. He says, son, God will provide. Amen? God will provide. And he didn't say that God will provide because Isaac and Abraham both know and they both understand that this sacrifice is not for them. This sacrifice is for God. And he says, son, don't worry about it. He said, God will provide. And notice the very next word in that verse. It says himself. God will provide himself. God is going to provide himself a, a lamb. He's going to provide a sacrifice for this worship. And it says the two of them went together. At some point. On this trip, you've got to think and you've got to understand. As we see the lamb on the mountain, we've got to understand that there had to be a conversation take place between Abraham and Isaac. Amen? There had to be a conversation that took place there. <clears throat> I want you to notice these next verses. In 9 and 10. Notice what the Bible says. And it's very important that you pick up on this because I think it is key to understanding what God is doing. In verses 9 and 10 it says, And they came to the place which God had told them. God had told him. Do you see that? Very important. Because if Abraham would have picked out the place, he might have missed it. Amen? Amen? But he followed God's instructions. He was following them to the very letter. He was being very faithful to the Lord. And he gets to the place where God showed him. He gets to that place and Abraham built an altar there. He placed the wood on the altar. And he bound his son Isaac. And he laid him on the altar. He's getting ready. Everything was in place. He stretches out his hand. And he takes the knife to slay his son. I find that interesting. How far Abraham was willing to go up to and including sacrificing his son. Now I said to you on the way up to on this mountain. That Abraham and Isaac had to have this conversation. Because... <coughs> Excuse me, because Isaac had already asked, where's the lamb? Where's the sacrifice? Have you ever had anybody say these words to you? Do you trust me? You ever had anybody say that to you? Do you trust me? And then them not give you any further explanation on that. At some point, Abraham and Isaac had to have the do you trust me conversation. And, and as I thought about that, and I think about the, the amount of faith that Abraham and Isaac were putting in each other and in God it is almost inconceivable. Do you trust me? Because they've come to the place where the altar is built, the wood is laid, Isaac is bound, he's laying on the altar, Abraham has his knife about to slay his son, doing exactly what God had told him to do, and he says, do you trust me? I guess we could ask the same question this morning. Do we trust the Lord? Because Abraham, or, or, or rather Isaac at that point, was putting all of his faith and trust in his dad, Abraham, right? 
At that point, Abraham was putting all of his faith and trust in his father, Father God. All of his faith and trust. Do you trust me? Do you trust me? Verses 11 and 12, it tells us that, that God calls Abraham. He calls him and he stops him. Now, we could say just in the nick of time. Amen. But then again, isn't God's timing always perfect? Always perfect. Abraham stops. He lifts up his eyes. And there behind him. A ram caught in the thicket. Now you might ask the question, why didn't he see that in the beginning? He wasn't focused on it. He wasn't looking for it at the time. He was going through with what the Lord had told him to. Caught a ram in the thicket. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. You pay attention to these words because I'm going to come back to them in a little while. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. Can we say amen to that? The Lord will provide. It said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. I read that verse. And I think about the Lord on, or the lamb on the mountain. And I read where it says that, that he brought Abraham and Isaac to the place where he told him. I see where Abraham was willing to go through with, with what the Lord had asked him to do. I see where the Lord had stopped the hand of Abraham. And I see where the Lord provided himself an offering for the burnt offering. I see all of these happening and I see them, I see them taking place. And I want to tell you this morning that, that this ram being caught in the, in the thicket, it was not an afterthought. Amen? It was not a second. It was not a backup plan. I can promise you this morning that it was the plan. Amen. It was the plan. We think about the lamb on the mountain. We think about the lamb on the cross. I can promise you this morning that our Lord Jesus Christ, it wasn't a backup plan. It wasn't a second thought. It wasn't an afterthought. It wasn't a, where God was in heaven and going, oh my goodness, my, my creation, my children, my uh, mankind has sinned. Oh my goodness, what do I do now? No, no, no. The Bible says that this lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. This thing was set in place. It was done before the foundation of the world. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, was set in place before the foundation of the world. So if we see the lamb on the mountaintop. We see, we see the lamb... Being the, being the sacrificial, we see the lamb being the substitute for ourselves. <clears throat> so we see him on the mountain, but there's another place where we can see. Actually, let's go back for just a minute, and I want to ask the same question that Isaac asked. He said, where's the lamb? We see the lamb on the mountaintop. Where's the lamb, Isaac? Well, the lamb, we can see him in the Passover as well. If you go from Genesis into the next book, into Exodus, there uh, uh, <clears throat> is where, where God had called Moses to lead the children out of Egypt. Now, we know how all of this happens. And, and for 400 years, the children, the Jews have been in, in bondage. They've been in slavery uh, down in Egypt. God's about to set them free. God's about to set them free and take them into the promised land. And God calls his servant Moses. Now, Moses is taking care of his father-in-law's sheep, and he calls to him out of the burning bush. God calls Moses to go back to Egypt. He said, Moses, here's what I want you to do. I know you were born and raised in Pharaoh's house, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back, and I want you to tell Pharaoh that it is time to set the Jews free. It's time to let them go. So Moses, he goes, and he goes back to Pharaoh, and he says, Pharaoh, um, the, the Lord, God wants you to, to turn us free. Pharaoh said, yeah, right. Moses comes back. Pharaoh, I don't think the Lord's joking. I'm pretty sure he's going to make sure this thing happens. Pharaoh said, it ain't happening. I said, All right. And Moses comes back time and time again. And each time Pharaoh's heart gets a little bit harder. He gets a little bit uh, uh, more stubborn. He gets a little bit more hard-headed. Ladies, y'all ain't never known a guy to be that way, have you? 
gets a little bit more hard-headed and he says, I'm not going to set these captives free. What wasn't long after that. You get over to an exodus and from chapter 1 all the way down over to chapter 11 because of his hard heart. The Lord sends 10 judgments, 10 plagues. The first nine are, 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 are not, uh, they're, they're bad. They're, they're horrible. But boy, it's that 10th one. It's that 10th one that gets their attention. It's that 10th one that finally breaks Pharaoh and he says, get out of my land. So what happened? What happened with that 10th plague? We call it the Passover. And there were very strict instructions that they had to follow. And, and, and what happened was is the instructions were to take in and to sacrifice the lamb. And they were to take the blood of this lamb and put it on the doorpost and on the lintel of the house. And during that judgment, during that 10th plague, when the Lord passes over, when the angel of death, when the angel passes over, if he saw the blood, if he saw that... That house had carried out those instructions. The death angel would pass over. If those instructions weren't carried out, the firstborn, that life would be taken. Firstborn. The blood of the lamb is what saved people on that first Passover. Let me tell you something. For 3,500 years, the Jews have still observed and still to this day observed that Passover. But it's interesting that when you look at the Passover and you think about that in relation to to our Lord being our Passover lamb, I want to parallel some scriptures for you. Because in Exodus chapter 12 and verse number 3, the Bible tells us there that the sacrifice had to be a lamb. Notice what it says. Notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and in the second part of verse number 7. And for indeed, for indeed Christ, our Passover. Christian, can we say amen to that? For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. He was the substitute. It was supposed to be us who died for our sins. But instead, Christ stepped in. Our Passover stepped in. Took our place on the cross of Calvary. For indeed Christ, our Passover. Exodus chapter 12, in verse number 5, it says that the lamb must be without, uh, without blemish. It m- must be absolutely perfect. I can't think of a better, a more perfect sacrifice than the lamb of God. First Peter chapter 1, in verse 18a, in verse 19, it says, Knowing that you were not redeemed by corruptible things. And verse 19 says this, but with the, what does he call it? The precious blood. Christian, can we say amen to that? The precious blood of Christ as the lamb without blemish, without spot. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 tells us that that Christ had no sin. When When you read through the passage, when you read about the crucifixion of Christ, you come to the point where he was on trial and he was standing before Pilate. When Pilate interviews him and and when Pilate inspects him, Pilate comes back in John chapter 19. In verse number 61, Pilate says, I find no fault in him. He was absolutely perfect. And... In Exodus chapter 12, in verse number 46, it tells us there that the Passover lamb must have no broken bones. When you get to John chapter 19 and verses 32 through 36, you find out there that the Roman soldiers didn't break the legs of Jesus as was common during that time. It was to speed up the death process, but it says that the, the Bible says that when the Roman soldiers got to Jesus, they found that he was already dead. He had already died. And by the way, it also goes back. Scripture tells us, it says that this happened in order to fulfill the Scriptures. And it actually goes back and it references a passage from Psalms. But what it really does, it goes back and references this passage from Exodus chapter 12 and verse number 46. The Bible, it tells us, is the point uh, uh, to, the, to Christ being our only hope of salvation. He is the perfect Lamb of God. He offered His life for 
our sins. But just like the Jews on that tenth plague, the only way it works is when the blood's applied. The only way it works is when the blood's applied. We find the lamb on the mountain. We find the lamb in the Passover. And Isaac asks, where is the lamb? Oh, the lamb is all throughout prophecy. The lamb is all throughout prophecy. Of all the scriptures that, that have foretold of his coming, Isaiah, he writes 500 years before Christ. Isaiah, he answers Isaac's question, where is the lamb? In Isaiah chapter 53 and verses 5 and 6, we even talked about this passage a little bit last week. The Bible says that he, and this is talking about no other than our Lord Jesus Christ. And we can trace it down and we can look at it and we can verify that this is true. But he, actually let's do it like this. But our Savior, let's make it personal. My Savior was wounded for my transgressions. Jesus was bruised for my iniquities. The punishment for my peace fell on him. My Lord was beaten. He was beaten beyond recognition so I could be healed. Listen, Scripture tells us that every one of us has missed a mark. The Bible says that every one of us has sinned. Every one of us is going our own way. And the Lord laid all of that, all of my sins, At his feet. He did it for me. Christian, he did it for you. The Lord has laid on him the sins of all of us. We find the lamb. We find him in prophecy, not just this one, man. He is is all throughout the Old Testament. Time and time again, we see him. Time and time again. John chapter 1 says that Jesus was there in the beginning. If he's there in the beginning, then ought we not be able to see him throughout Scripture? And we do. We see him all throughout Scripture. And we get down to John chapter 1 and verse number 14. When he steps out of heaven, when he steps off of the pages of the Old Testament and steps into the New Testament and says, here I am, the Messiah that you've been waiting for has come. And we see the lamb, Isaac, we see the lamb in the manger. Scripture being fulfilled throughout the Throughout all of this, we look and we, we see the lamb that they've been waiting for. We see him show up in the manger. And it's very interesting to me. Talking about lambs, that, 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 that is to angels. Have you ever thought about, man, of all the people that, that could have received the news of Jesus' birth first? Why shepherds? Why? It's not like that they were the the greatest in society, man. I mean, shepherds? Why? Because this is the Lamb of God. Why shepherds? Because sheep were used, especially in Old Testament, sheep were used for so many things, not just their wool, but sheep were were used in, in, in worship. They were used in temple sacrifices. By the way, read the pastor's corner again this morning. You, you'll understand this. Read the pastor's corner. But sheep were used in temple worship as well. Why did the angels show up to shepherds in a field? They showed up because these shepherds were out there uh, uh, taking care of these sheep, many of these sheep quite possibly to be used in future temple worship. And I don't know if the shepherds made the connection or not, but did they realize that the angels, the news that these angels brought was going to be an end to that temple worship sacrifice for those sheep, or at least it ought to have been. 
basically these angels were coming and saying, Shepherds, I don't know if you realize this or not, but the, but the, the, the ultimate sacrifice has just been born. Shepherds, I don't know if you realize it or not, but the Lamb that will take away all of the sins has just been born. Shepherds, I don't know if you realize it or not, but one of the greatest things in history has just happened. Shepherds. And I said, we got to go see this. I went to the village. I found Mary and Joseph. And there he was. The Lamb of God. Laying in a manger. I don't know if they realized it or not. But that baby was a lamb of God. That word found is an interesting word. It says found after a search. Here's the thing. They didn't just sit back and take what the angels had told them. They didn't just sit back and do nothing. They went and looked. They searched, they found. You read down through Luke chapter 2. We actually read this passage Sunday night. We read down through Luke chapter 2 and we see these, unvents, these events unfolding. We'll see what happens. But it's interesting to me about the shepherds and what they did. The shepherds didn't just say there. They, 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 they went and they saw this, this Lamb of God in the manger. The Bible says that they went and told everybody that they found, everybody that they could see, all the things that the angels had told them. And then they came back. They came back. And the Bible says that they returned doing what? Glorifying and praising God. I don't know if they really made the connection or not. But we see this act of worship. All throughout the Old Testament, whether they realized it or not, they were worshiping the Lamb of God. The one that was going to take away our sins. Many times in the New Testament, I don't know if they realized it or not, but they were worshiping the Lamb of God. The lamb that would take away our sins. Today I don't know if you realize it or not. But it's Christmas time. The time that we come. As we should all year. Worship the lamb. That's going to take away our sins. And that has taken away our sins. If you're here this morning. And you don't know. The lamb of God then I invite you to come and to meet him. Come and see, the angels told the shepherds. Come and see. I pray this morning that you have met Jesus. If you hadn't, the time is now. Father, we thank you for the day and hour you've given to us this time, this opportunity to come in your house again to worship and to praise you. Lord, is as we think about this message this morning and we look at you being the lamb all throughout scripture father i pray that everyone this morning pray that everyone here this morning has applied the blood applied the blood of the passover that has allowed you to be there their substitute on the cross that has seen you throughout prophecy has seen you step out of heaven and to be laid in a manger that has seen you nailed to a cross and has worshipped you for salvation of our sins 
Father, this morning as we go into this invitation, if there's a heart here that's not right with you, then Lord, I pray that they get that taken care of this morning. Father, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. We stand as we sing our hymn of invitation.